I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> it's all turned on before I turn the clock on. And then it's okay. Let me, time. I hope I don't have a snowball as your brother Morris did. You're ready to go. All right. Yeah, you better sit. There you go. <laughs> they told me that I was already late, so what time is it? Ten after, so I won't have to do this too long, okay? Uh, at any rate, I, I, I want to thank uh, Brother Richard and Grace School of Bible for having me. You know, it's a great honor for our old redneck like me to be up here with all these Bible scholars. Uh, on the way home, I told Betty, I said, uh, we need to stop over at the recruiting office and see if I can be one of those 500 rednecks that volunteer to go to <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> but then she told me that I didn't know who Dale Earnhardt was, so I said I didn't qualify. But uh, it's always a pleasure to get up here and see all the good people, meet new friends, and see some old ones. I'm glad to see Brother Bob Barlow here. Me and him, back in the day, we had a, de a debate over at our church. and But I cheated a little. I stacked the audience. <laughs> but it's always good to be here. And it's a great honor for me to, to even be considered. But uh, today my, my subject is about prayer and the grace prayer. And the understanding of prayer under grace and the privilege that we have that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Uh, my first verse here is uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Before I, before I read that verse, I, I'm not very good at telling jokes. Most people don't understand my jokes anyhow. But I will tell you a story, okay, uh, about prayer. When I was uh, in Vietnam, they had a they had uh, a story going around about these two soldiers that were out in the wilderness of there, and uh, they were surrounded by the enemies. And it didn't look like that they were going to get out alive. So one said to the other, I think we ought to pray. And the other one said, I don't know how. Well, they waited around a minute and one said, okay, I'm going to try it because I used to live next to this big church and Every Saturday night as I went by, they were in there praying. So he said, bow your head, we're going to pray. And he said, be 15. <laughs> I don't know where y'all got that or not. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of shows how slow we are, right? <laughs> but let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get into our message here. Well, Father, we do thank you again for the opportunity to stand and thank you so much, Lord, for what you've done for us. Ask now that uh, your blessings be upon this time that we might learn how to pray and what to pray for. In Christ's name, amen. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, 
It says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, as grace believers, we know that the book of Hebrews is what? It's the one book in the Bible that you do not have any problem understanding who it's written to. It says Hebrews, right? I mean, that's really hard to get. Uh, But it says to find grace. Uh, They're going to be able to find grace in a time of need in the tribulation period and in the millennial reign when Christ is sitting on the throne and being their high priest. Now, we know that those verses pertain to them, and they're going to be able to find grace. But we already have grace, do we not? I already have it. I don't have to find it. What's one thing that we have that they don't have? Well, Romans 5.11 says we have now the atonement. I've been atoned for. Now, not later on, but now. So I don't need to find grace. Paul is very plainly going to tell us that we also can come boldly before the throne of grace. Look at uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 18. Ephesians two eighteen. For through him we both have grace. Excuse me. For through him we both have grace. And I can't even follow my lines here. And access by one spirit unto the Father. So we have access to the Father by the Spirit, do we not? While we're in Ephesians, look at uh, 3 and verse 11. 3 and verse 11. According to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So we have boldness today to come before the throne of grace. And we can do that because of the faith of him. And it was his faith, not ours, He was faithful. You know, in the King James Bible, it's very important to see that. It says the faith of, not faith in, that the Bible is always changing to. The faith of Jesus Christ is what we're going by. He did it all for us. He was faithful to go to the cross for us. And because of that, we have access to the throne of grace. And today, we, we pray to the Father, and we have access to that because of his faith and what he did for us on the cross. Okay, I'm going to compare a couple of verses, and one of them is Romans 8 and verse 26. This verse is probably one of the verses that's quoted by more than any other when it comes to praying. Romans eight twenty six. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts know what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, when people read that verse, what's the first thing that's going to come to their mind? Well, I don't even know what to pray for, right? 
You all hear that. You don't even know what to pray for. And they're going to tell you that the Spirit is going to do the intercession for you and tell God the Father what what you really need through the will of God. Now, you all know that. You've heard that, right? Well, I want to compare this to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18 and 19. Ephesians 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayers and supplications in the Spirit, watching therefore with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. Now when I compare these two verses, with the two verses in Romans chapter 8, do I see something different? Do I see something different? The answer is yes. You know what Paul has learned from the time he wrote Romans until he gets to the book of Ephesians? Well, he's learned how to pray. He no longer tells in the book of Ephesians he no longer says that he don't know what to pray for as he ought. And what I'm trying to get across to you here today is that we, being in the body of Christ, say people living in the age of grace, we ought to know what to pray for as we ought. We ought to know. We should know. You know, Paul was still getting revelations, was he not? Sure he was. And we ought to be able to distinguish those differences. Today, when you study your Bible, the Spirit of God ought to have taught you how to pray. Because you have studied the Word of God and know what it says and know who it's written to. And today you ought to know how to pray. And I'll give you a few more verses here today. But think about that. The twelve apostles in Jesus' day when he was on the earth. What did they do? You know what they did? They came to Jesus and they said, Teach us to pray. Did they not? They didn't know how to pray. They didn't know how to pray. And what did Jesus do? Well, he taught them how to pray. Everybody knows uh, what is called the Lord's Prayer, and really it's not the Lord's Prayer, it's the the disciples' prayer, right? So he teaches them how to do that. And guess what churches do today? They repeat that prayer every Sunday morning. And then they can be seated. That's not your prayer. It has nothing at all to do with you. Give us this day our daily bread. Think about this. When I read my Bible, how am I supposed to obtain my daily bread? Paul said, if you don't work, you don't eat. Well, I thank God for our government. He allowed me not to work for the last 30 years. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't understand. (laughs) Our, Our government does not understand this principle. So you guys keep... Paying them taxes, brothers. <laughs> they don't understand that. But that's what that's what the scriptures say. And we ought to go by that. You know, you realize what our government has done? Our government has taken the church's responsibility 
and they have taken that, and we said, go ahead. In Paul's day, it was the church's responsibility to take care of its own. And what have we done? So Paul learned how to pray. And he tells us how to pray. So Paul wants to be, one of his requests is that he could open his mouth boldly to let people know about this mystery. So that's one of the prayers we ought to pray every day. Lord, let me open my mouth boldly. Just so that I can give the gospel of Jesus Christ out to a lost and dying world. And you're going to see also that he prays for himself that he might have a door of utterance open unto him. That's what we need to pray for. We need to pray that God would open a door of utterance so that we could give the gospel out to a lost and dying world. That ought to be our prayer today. And Paul is our pattern, is he not? So if Paul's our pattern, then we ought to read how Paul prayed and what he prayed for. And by doing that, we can understand the mystery that God has revealed to us. Philippians 1 and verse 4. Always in every prior mind for you making request, request with joy. On that same line, look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 16. It says, ceasing not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17, that God, that the God of our Father, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. See what Paul is praying for? He's praying for individuals. And that's what we ought to do. We ought to be praying for individual people, brothers and sisters in Christ. We ought to pray for those people. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about praying for healing. You'll know that. You'll know what God's doing today. Let me give you a clue. If you get sick today, you you know what you ought to do? You ought to go to the doctor. Now, I realize that you ought to call some people and have them pray for you. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But God is not in the business of doing signs, miracles, and wonders today. He's not doing that today. And we ought to know that. And we ought to realize what he's doing today. And by the way, do you know how God knows how much you know about his will today? It's how you pray. If I pray for stuff that, that I know that God's not doing today, how much, what do you think God knows about me? He knows that I have not learned His will. You see what I'm talking about? That's very important. Very important to know. Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 2. Here he gives you a detailed description on what to pray for. And how you should pray. 
continue in prayer and watch in the, in the same with thanksgiving with all prayers also for us that God will open unto us a door of others to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak walking in wisdom towards them that are without redeeming the time let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man Number one, Paul says, continue in prayer. Giving thanks, giving with supplication. You see that word supplication? Well, let me let me give you an example of that. And we had it out here, uh, I believe it was Monday night. Brother John needed some help, right? So we supplied what help we could. You know, it wouldn't have done no good to pray to for Brother John for his bills to be paid unless we were willing to supply the need. If I was hungry and needed something to eat, and you said, Oh, brother, I'll pray for you. You know what I would do? I'd starve to death. It wouldn't do me. It wouldn't do me no good. And if you're not willing to supply a little bit of that help, don't do you no good to pray for it, does it? I wouldn't think so. Praying for others and ourselves also that God would open that door of utterance so that we could give the mystery of Christ out to a lost and dying world. You see what he's saying? That's what we need to pray for. Why would I want to pray for you that the door of others would be given to you and I couldn't pray that a door of others were given to me? I want you to go, but I ain't got time. Praying that we should make his word manifest by walking in wisdom to them that are lost. You know, we need to know and make the word of God manifest out there to a lost and dying world. And that's what Paul's telling us to pray for. That's what he's telling us to do. Praying for the Lord to help our speech be with grace and for him to help to help us understand his word so that we ought to answer every man. You ought to be able to answer questions that come up. We do a hour program on TV, and don't tell any of the righteous brothers, but I have a woman sitting there with me. And she can answer questions to the women that call in, also to some of the men call in and ask a question. I had a, a guy call me and said, well, you know that women are not supposed to preach. And I said, oh, yes, I, I realize that. And I said, uh, as far as I know, she's not preaching. She's just answering questions. And if you have any problem with that, well, turn it down until she quits talking and then turn it back up. You see, you've got to be... <laughs> I'm sure that's not what Paul's talking about. <laughs> uh, but you've got to be able to give a, 
answer to every man, every woman. Uh, so we need to have our speech correctly in this. You know, I don't have no problem with that. I can deal with people as long as they don't get smart. I mean, then I have a problem. And they have a problem. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 6 and 7. Ephesians 4 and verse 6 and 7. Paul says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall uh, keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Now, when I read that verse, you know, it says, be careful for nothing. Let your request be known unto God. What you got to realize and what you got to see is that if I, if I understand and know what Paul is teaching us about prayer, then what would I, my request be? What would my request be? You see what I mean? If I understood and knew how to pray, what would my request be? Well, it wouldn't be something that God's not doing today, would it? No, it would. Uh, I'd be praying for boldness. We went over that. I would be praying that a door of utterance be given to me. I would be praying for fellow saints. See, that's what I'd be praying for. And that's what you ought to be praying for. See, if you know what God's doing today, you don't have no problem with these verses. You don't have no problem at all. Let your request be known unto God. Tell him. Talk to him. It's a communication between you and God. Let him know what's on your heart. Let the Spirit of God guide you so that you can know what to pray for and how to pray. So, I believe that's what Paul's trying to teach us. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Here is what God is able to do with your prayers. Okay? Here is what he's able to do. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we might ask for. Is he not? What do we have working within us? If you've been saved by the grace of God today, what do you have? You are the temple of God. And the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. And that Spirit is the power of God. And He is teaching you what to pray for. And He is telling you that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you might ask for or think of. Think about this. You know, the old body, what's going to happen to it? It's going to it's going to die and it's going to return to the ground, is it not? The only thing that's not saved about me is this old body. 
And one day it's going to the ground and return to it. One day I'm going to get something that I don't have today. I'm going to get a new body. And see, he is able to do exceedingly above all of that. I was thinking about this this morning. Boy, I'd hate to live eternity in this thing. I I got to look this way in 70 some years. I'd hate to see what I look like in a couple of million, wouldn't you? (laughs) Yeah, but he's able to do exceedingly above all that we might ask for. Can we not thank God for that? To be able to thank him that one day we'll have no pain, we'll have no sorrow. We will all be changed in a moment and twinkle of an eye at the last trump. Are you not thankful for that? Yeah, I am. Now, First Corinthians chapter two and verse ten. Boy, I'm down to fourteen minutes. I can't believe I did this. First Corinthians 2 and verse 10. But God has revealed unto us by the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, even the deep things of God. See, the Spirit of God has revealed to us the things that have been hidden, the things that we now know we didn't know until we opened God's Word and started studying it and knowing what He said to us then we didn't know that. We didn't know a lot of things. But the deep things of God, we can now open the Scripture and we can understand them. Why is that? Because I have the Spirit of God in me and I am the temple of God. But the Spirit is the one that does that. Colossians 1 and verse 26. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generation, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of riches of glory of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope of glory so Christ in us we have Christ in us then we ought to know what to pray for we have Christ in us we have the Holy Spirit we are the temple of God We can see that very plainly. And through our prayers, God understands what we know about that ministry. What we know about his will. And don't forget this. If you pray for something that's not according to his will, well then he understands that you do not understand that mystery. So that's what the, what we pray, and he understands that. He understands where we're at, because he knows what our prayers are. Do you realize that every prayer you ever pray has been answered? Every prayer that you've ever prayed has been answered? Remember what Paul did? Paul had a thorn in the flesh. Did he not? Sure he did. You know what Paul did? He prayed three times that that be removed from him. 
You know what God's answer to Paul was? 2 Corinthians 12, 19. 2 Corinthians 12, 19. Excuse me, 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'd rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you see what that says? That his grace is sufficient. You don't need nothing else. You have the grace of God. He has given you the grace of God. You have that. You've been atoned for. Everything that's going to happen to you happened that moment that you believed and trusted that Jesus Christ died on that cross for your sin. And that he was, let me just go ahead and give you the gospel here in closing. Christ died for our sin. Did he not? Amen. He was buried. And you know what happens when you get buried? You you are taken out of sight. Praise the Lord for that. You are taken out of sight. When you get buried, your sins are what? Gone. That's what happened when he did it for us. And then the last part of that in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 through 4 says that he rose again. Romans 4, 25. He rose again the third day for our justification so that we can stand just before God. And salvation is a simple message. All you got to do is believe and trust in that and that alone. Nothing else. You can't do anything. So prayer is all about letting God know your situation. Letting God know what you know about His will. Think about that. It's so important to understand that. I'll close with this verse here. Ephesians 5 and verse 10. Well, I might have got the wrong words. But that's okay. Uh, 5.18. All right, thank you. Well, that's a good verse. Let me go ahead and read it down. <laughs> and be not drunk with wine, wearing as excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Hey, that's a good verse too. Don't you agree? <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I lost some of my verses here, but that's okay. You've got to consider who I am. I, I realize that most of you here today is perfect. Um, <laughs> but I'm waiting for that day when I'll be perfect, okay? So let's go to the Lord in prayer and I'll be through. Father, again, we come to you thanking you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for taking care of our sin problem. We pray, Lord, that uh, we might learn how to pray. We might know what is that perfect will of God, that we can pray to you, Lord, and you can understand our knowledge in the mystery. And we'll give you the praise and honor for it. In Christ's name, amen.